In this video, we'll be going over IRS Form 4562, Depreciation and Amortization. Although this is only a two-page tax form, there is a lot of complexity involved in depreciating and amortizing costs uh, and in deducting those costs from taxable income. So for the purpose of this video, we're going to go over the form itself will lightly discuss some of the specific depreciation or amortization related topics. But the intention for this video is for this to be less than an hour. Uh, if I went into detail about every single topic that we're going to cover, this would probably be a five or six hour video. So uh, I'll briefly uh, touch on some of the concepts here. Uh, if you want me to uh, go over any of those concepts or topics in more depth, please post a comment in the comment section of this video or send me an email or post a comment in the article. And I will do my best to uh, create a video specifically drilling down into that particular topic. So uh, before we begin with the form, we're going to go over uh, the six different parts of this form. So in part one, we'll talk about uh, how to expense property under section 179. Uh, in part two, we'll talk about special depreciation allowance and other depreciation. In part three, we'll discuss uh, maker's uh, depreciation, which uh, stands for modified accelerated cost recovery system. Makers, some people pronounce it macros. In part four, that's the summary where we combine the depreciation amounts from the other sections and we uh, include them uh, or summarize them here. In part five, we specifically discuss listed property. Listed property includes uh, automobiles or other vehicles and then property that could be used for entertainment or recreation or amusement purposes. Uh, since uh, most of this property is property that could be used for either business or personal use. Uh, the IRS has specific instructions on how taxpayers can clarify the business use of listed property. So we'll go over that in detail. And finally, in part six, we'll discuss amortization and uh, what that looks like. So let's go back to the top. Uh, briefly, Section 179 is a part of the Internal Revenue Code that allows a taxpayer to deduct the entire cost of equipment that was placed into service in a given year, uh, tax year without having to expense it over the expected life of that property. There are certain restrictions to Section 179, uh, but uh, So there are restrictions based on the type of property that you're putting into service, uh, the dollar amount or the cost, and then also income-related restrictions. So uh, there's a lot of detail in the form instructions. And again, we're simply going to go through the form itself. So I imagine that someone will probably ask me to create a video specifically drilling down into Section 179, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait until... Uh, I get feedback from everyone to uh, be able to understand what I should drill down into. So we're going to complete the top of the form and we'll pretend that John Smith is running a import, uh, not an import, export business. We'll just call it a uh, general sales business, like a retail business. And then his identifying number, we'll just list down his social security number. Okay, so we'll just go through line by line. 
starting with uh, line one. In this year's form, the maximum amount, amount that the IRS will allow you to expense uh, happens to be uh, 1.08 million. I believe tax preparation software automatically puts in the commas. However, PDF does, uh, Adobe does not. So that is the maximum ceiling of uh, of Section 179 deduction that you're able to take for property placed into service. In line two, you're going to enter the total cost of all Section 179 property that was placed into service in the given tax year. So when you uh, put this in, you need to include everything that was uh, considered listed property from Part 5, which is why if you have listed property, you should complete Part 5 before you complete Part 1. So if you have vehicles that you're trying to expense under Section 179, if you have those personal use type items that might be considered listed property, and you choose to list uh, expense it under 179, you need to complete part five and then circle back to part one. So we'll just fast forward and for uh, use of this, we'll just assume that our taxpayer uh, put into service uh, $1 million worth of property. So you should also include any property that was placed in service by your spouse even if you're filing a separate tax return, uh, and this also includes Section 179 real property that your spouse made the election for. So in addition to the maximum amount, there's also a threshold cost. So uh, you, there's, there's a limit to how much Section 179 uh, property you can invest in in a given tax year before your uh, allowable uh, limitation starts to go down. So, um, and in this year, that amount is $2.7 million, which means if you bought $5 million worth of equipment in the given year, then we'd have to calculate the limit, you know, that we would see right here. Now, there is a worksheet in the IRS instructions specifically for lines one, two, and three. But realistically, the line one amount is going to be uh, the smaller of either $1.08 million or the um, total cost of property that you put into service. So uh, because I'm walking you through this and not necessarily the worksheet. Uh, we'll go back up and we'll change this to reflect what the worksheet would have come out with. But generally speaking, that maximum amount for the tax year for this tax year is $1.08 million. Then there's a maximum threshold cost. So <clears throat> you'll enter the amount um, basically. Um, so you'll you'll enter the amount uh, in the form instructions uh, on a certain line and once you get through the worksheet then it tells you what number to put into lines two and lines three so um, line one is is the smaller of the worksheet calculation and then line three is the threshold co uh, cost of the property 2.7 million dollars now to calculate a, a reduction in your limitation you'll subtract line three from line one so if this number happened to be zero then that's what it is if this was five million dollars then we would have to enter 2.3 million, right? So that's how that would look. But because our amount that we put into service is less than the reduction in limitation amount, our reduction is zero. That's basically what line four is saying. 
and then you need to uh, subtract line four from line one. Basically, we put a million dollars worth of equipment into service, and because we did not exceed the threshold cost, uh, we're able to um, deduct the entire cost of this property uh, subject to any other limitations that we'll see as we get down into part one. So um, for the threshold section for the total deductibility, uh, we put a million dollars worth of property into service and we're still eligible to expense that in the entire the entire amount in the tax year. So in line six, we're going to put a description of the property, the cost, and then the elected cost. Um, and you know, for de description, you can put in a brief description. Let's call it office furniture. And then we can put in, uh, let's see, qualified improvement property. And we'll just say that each of those co cost 500000 Now the elected cost is the amount that you choose to uh, expense as opposed uh, to depreciating over time. So this is where you get to make the Section 179 election. Uh, you can elect to expense in the given tax year up to uh, the amount that we put into column B, but you can't expect, expense more than what it costs you. You can expense less, and then you would put the rest of it on a depreciation schedule. So if you wanted to only uh, expense $200,000 of office furniture, you can do that. And again, when we get to the business income limitations and other limitations, you may have to go back and elect uh, a certain amount or carry it over to the following tax year. Um, to make things straightforward for this example, we're going to choose to expense 100% of the cost of everything. Now for listed property, we haven't uh, entered anything uh, under listed property um, because we haven't completed part five yet. So if we did, we would take the amount from part line 29, which is the total um, amount of listed property costs that we elected to uh, expense in the given year instead of depreciate, that number then comes up here. For the purpose of this walkthrough, we'll say that that number is zero. So now we're going to uh, go into line eight and we're going to calculate uh, the total of all of these. So this is still a million dollars. And now uh, this is our first litmus, litmus test. Uh, we're going to enter the smaller of either line 5 or line 8. Now, since I walked through this example, I kind of chose numbers to make these reflect an equal equal number. But if this was, um, let's say, $2 million, then we would only be able to put $1 million under line 9, since that's what we put down as our dollar limitation for the year. And again, this all flows back to the amount of property we put into service. So if you change the numbers up here, it can have a trickle-down effect somewhere down here. Now, if you're playing with tax software, it'll make these calculations pretty much automatically, but you should still understand how those calculations are derived. So in line 10, you're going to enter the carryover of a disallowed deduction from the previous year's tax year. Uh, it doesn't mean that it was uh, not an authorized deduction. It simply meant that it wasn't authorized or allowed to be uh, deducted from your income in the previous year. And so disallowed uh, deductions are carried forward to the next tax year. So let's just um, Imagine that we're carrying over $50,000 of disallowed deduction from the previous year. So uh, in line 11, we're going to enter the smaller of either what's on line 5 
or our business income. So let's imagine that our business income is $1.5 million. We would still put a million dollars here. But if our business income was only $500,000, then we have to enter that smaller amount. And in order to do that, uh, what we would do is we would total lines uh, 9 and 10, so that is $1.05 million, but you can't enter a number more than line 11. So because we put $500,000 as our business income, that's what we're stuck with here. However, if, if we you know, had a number of $1.5 million, then we could expense the entire amount here. So if this amount was here, without respect to how it impacts these calculations, then you would be able to total $1 million plus the $50,000 and include that as the entire uh, deduction, right? So as it currently stands, we're stating that our business had $500,000 of income. That's the limitation, which means the total of the rest of this is the $550,000 that we're not allowed to expense in the current tax year, and then we're going to carry it forward. So this is one of those things where, you know, you know, talk to your accountant or your tax professional when it comes to tax planning for uh, big picture, uh, long view of your business expenses. So planned capital investments, um, taxable events, uh, recognition of income, all of this, you know, has kind of a near term timing effect of how you're going to uh, depreciate property or expense it. Uh, under 179. So this this might take your accountant or if you have a CFO or financial person that you just throw a bunch of papers at, it might take that person a little bit of time to kind of come up with the right plan, but then also expect that that person might come back and, and give you some thoughtful ideas on how to uh, create the tax biggest tax benefit based on your business plan. So enough about section 179, let's go down to part two. So part two includes a special depreciation that is not, um, that isn't under the maker's model. So it's not section 179 expense, it's, um, you know, certain qualified property uh, has a special depreciation allowance. So for example, uh, qualified property acquired after September 17th, 2017, the advent of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, you can depreciate certain property um, or a, a certain depreciation allowance uh, for up to 100% of the depreciable basis. So the form instructions contain specific detail, but examples include tangible property under, depreciated under makers with a recovery period of uh, 20 years or less, computer software as defined by the tax code, qualified film, television, and theatrical productions, or 25-year water utility property. There's also qualified reuse and recycling property and certain plants that bear fruits and nuts might all be um, placed into service during the tax year. So let's just imagine that for some reason our general sales and retail business placed in the service $100,000 worth of this property. Then you would also, or placed into service the property, and then from that property, we ended up being able to uh, generate $100,000 of depreciation expense for that property. So uh, in line 15, we'll discuss property that was uh, depreciated under section 168 F1. So this is a property that you would depreciate under the unit of production method or another method not based on a term of years. So uh, anything that's listed in on, on line 15, you need to attach a separate sheet that shows a description of the property, 
the depreciation method, and then the basis, uh, the adjusted basis, and how you calculated that basis. So we'll just assume that there's $50,000 of said property in part two. Now in line 16, uh, you basically are totaling all other forms of depreciation. So this includes accelerated cost recovery system depreciation under the pre-1987 rules, property placed in the service before 1981, certain public utility property, uh, certain property acquired from related persons, um, non-recognition transactions, certain sound recordings, movies, and videos, or property depreciated under the income forecast method which is limited to motion picture films, videos, sound recordings, copyrights, books, and patents. There's also a list of other uh, types of property that might qualify for other types of depreciation or, you know, that might be grandfathered under, you know, very old tax code rules. We're going to assume for the basis of this example that we don't have any other depreciable property under that um, that, that qualifies for other depreciation. So uh, now we're on part three, which is the makers or mackers depreciation, however you say it. Uh, so in line 17, you're going to enter the deduction for all assets that you placed into service before 2022 that is depreciated under uh, the current depreciation model. It's also referred to as a maker's asset. So uh, you can see the instructions uh, for, um, for column G, which is calculating the depreciation deduction. So for property that was placed into service during the tax year, you're going to spit all this out. For previously declared property, since the IRS can simply just go back to your previous tax year returns to, to audit them, you're only putting the total here. So let's just say you have $50,000 worth of said depreciation. So now we're in section B, which is assets placed into service during the tax year using general depreciation. So under makers, there are two different types of depreciation system. You have the general depreciation system and the alternative depreciation system, also known as ADS. So in line 19, we're specifically in section B, uh, we're going to be focused on uh, assets placed into service during the 2022 tax year. We won't go into too much detail about the different types of property. Uh, there's more information in the article that I just published about what types of property uh, qualify as 3, 5, 7, 10, 15, 20, and 25 year property. There's also 50-year property, there's residential and non-residential real property. So all of those have different recovery periods. Uh, what we're going to focus on is what you put into each column. So, um, and, and then we'll lightly talk about recovery periods, conventions, and methods. So uh, we'll just assume that all of our property that we're placing into service is seven-year property, which by the way, is kind of the default uh, property uh, recovery period for anything that uh, does not have a class life and is not otherwise classified. So you can refer to uh, either the form instructions or you can also um, uh, go to IRS publication 946 to uh, walk through how you would classify certain property if it's not specifically designated, say, in the form instructions. So let's just say our office furniture, which we did uh, expense some of up here, we'll just say that we have some more office furniture that we didn't expense here. And so uh, that, that would be seven-year property. Um, and, uh, the, pro the recovery period for each of these items uh, is basically the same uh, period of time as, as outlined 
So 20 year property has a 20 year uh, recovery period, right? So uh, in column B, you would put the month and year placed in service, but that's really for uh, real property, either residential or non-residential. Uh, the difference between residential and non-residential is that residential uh, rental property, 80% uh, of the gross revenue has to be from uh, residential leases as opposed to uh, any other uh, real property that is uh, neither residential uh, and it doesn't have a class life of less than 27 and a half years. Uh, for example, some farm buildings have 20 or 25 uh, year recovery per periods, um, but non-residential real property has a 39 year recovery period. Residential real property, for some reason, has a 27.5 year recovery period. So uh, because uh, re real property uses what's known as a mid-month convention, you would have to put the month and the year that it's placed into service. So basis for depreciation, we were talking about our office furniture. Let's just say that we buy $10,000 worth of de uh, a property that we would depreciate over seven years. So we'll use that as a calculation when we get to that section. Um, in column E, the convention, uh, there's an applicable convention for uh, depreciation. It's either half year convention, mid quarter convention, or mid month convention. So mid month convention applies only to real property. Uh, for the three through 25 year property, uh, we're specifically either talking about half year convention or mid quarter convention. Uh, the, the easy way to um, tell the difference is that uh, unless the mid-quarter convention applies, you will use the half-year convention here. So the mid-quarter convention comes into play if, for some reason, you buy a bunch of stuff towards the end of the tax year and put it all into service during the last three months. So if uh, the total depreciable basis of everything that you put into service during the tax year, um, if, if everything that you put into service during the last three months uh, exceeds 40% of that amount, then you would use the mid-quarter convention instead of the half-year convention. So we're going to say that we're using the half-year convention, and that's HY as the acronym. If you were using the mid-quarter, it would be MQ. So now methods of depreciation, you can use a straight line. You can use the straight line depreciation for uh, anything that you choose to depreciate. And that simply means that you can um, take $10,000 divided by seven, and that equal amount is applicable for every single tax year. So there is one way that you can do that. Uh, there are a couple of other ways. Uh, there's the 200% declining balance. There's the 150% declining balance. And we won't go into too much detail other about each of those other than to say that uh, you would use those in situations if you want to accelerate the depreciation of an asset that you've put into service to take that deduction in the year. Uh, you can make that election, um, but once you make it, then it's uh, you're pretty much stuck with an election unless you know you're scaling back down. So, for example, if you decided to put in uh, the 200 uh, declining, 200% uh, declining balance. Uh, you can use that, uh, but then you would have to switch to the straight line method in the first tax year where the straight line rate exceeds the declining balance rate. Um, but let's just say that for now we're going to use the straight line method. Uh, and then uh, based on that, uh, you can calculate uh, column G. You would simply divide um, that amount you know, by... So because it was placed into service, um, you know, 
we're using the half year convention, you're basically able to take half of the depreciation uh, in the current tax year that you placed it in a service. So if you divided uh, 10,000 by seven, you get something, well, let's make this easier. We'll call it 14,000. That way my head doesn't have to hurt doing the math. So normally you would put uh, $2,000 in because that's uh, $14,000 divided by seven. It would make sense that you're um, you know, able to de depreciate $2,000 this year. But because this was the year that you placed your asset in the service, you're only able to uh, use uh, half of the years, uh, that's the convention part, half of the years um, period for deduction purposes. So that $2,000 would be 1,000. And then the next year, uh, it would be part of that $2,000 would be part of the information, the number that you would put into uh, line 17. Oh, by the way, for lines 18, if you placed assets into service in the tax year, uh, you can kind of bundle them into one or more general asset accounts. And you might do this if you have a long list of stuff or if you have a lot of uh, very similar stuff that you put into service at the same time. That way you can depreciate multiple items as if it was one asset. Uh, each general asset account must include only assets that were placed in service during the tax year. They have the same depreciation method, the same recovery period, and the same convention. Uh, you cannot use an asset uh, in a general asset account if it might be considered listed property, if it's used for both personal and business investment uses. Okay, so, and then there are spe uh, other special rules that might apply when it comes to the disposal of um, general asset account uh, assets. So, um, we'll move down to uh, assets that were placed into service under the ADS system. So, uh, there is a decent list of items that would fit this um this classification, but basically you're going to uh, do the same thing under ADS that you would do, that you did for here. Uh, some examples of items that must be depreciated under ADS include tax exempt use property, imported property covered by a presidential ex executive order, tan tangible property used pr predominantly outside the United States. So we're not going to get into this uh, for the purpose of this discussion because uh, it, it, the mechanics are very similar to what we just did in Section B. Okay, so in the summary, uh, this is where we're going to uh, total uh, the amounts uh, you know, from all the different places where we listed uh, depreciation. Uh, since we haven't gone uh, to listed property yet, We'll skip item 21 for now, but so far we can add all the items from lines 12, uh, 14 through 17, and then 19 and 20, right? So line 12, we had $500,000. In lines 14 through 17, we had $200,000. And then in line 19 and 20, we had a total of thousand dollars so that gives us two uh, seven hundred and one thousand dollars that we can enter here so this is what you would enter uh, on your uh, on the appropriate lines of your tax return uh, for partnerships and S corps uh, basically uh, you do not include any section 179 expense deduction so you would have to back out that $500,000 if you're an S corporation or a partnership because those section 179 expenses get passed through on uh, every partners or shareholders K1. So in line 23, if there were assets that were pl uh, placed into service during the current year, you'll enter the portion of the basis that's attributable to uh, section 263 a costs 
So uh, those are costs that must be capitalized uh, and allocated amongst activities. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you would have to go to Treasury Regulations 1.263A-1. So for the purpose of this video, we're going to assume that number is zero. All right. So in part five, this is the listed property. There are three sections. So there's section A, which is the depreciation of the actual property. Uh, there's section B, which is uh, information on the use of vehicles. And again, if you don't use vehicles, you don't need to complete section B or section C. Section C are questions for employers who provide vehicles for use by their employees. And basically, this is a series of screening questions to make sure that these uh, vehicles that are being expensed are actually um, not being, like there's not a commingling of the business and the personal use uh, of those vehicles. So for the purpose of this, we're going to say that we have one car that we placed in the service. And uh, under line 25, you can include uh, any qualified listed property um, that qualifies for a special depreciation allowance. Uh, this might be um, property placed into service between September 27th, 2017 and before January 1st, 2027. Uh, this is included in the overall limit on depreciation and section 179 expense. So for the purpose of this illustration, we'll include this as zero, but this is just another way of being able to depreciate a little bit more upfront. So lines 26 and lines tw and 27 have a very similar uh, kind of uh, data entry. So line 26 is for property that's used more than 50% any qualified business use, whereas uh, line 27 would be 50% or less in a qualified business use. Uh, for vehicles, uh, basically you would uh, uh, calculate the total number of miles that the vehicle is driven in a year. And then you would calculate the total number of miles that the vehicle was driven for business, not necessarily commuting or personal use, but strictly business. And if the business miles are more than 50% of the total miles, then you have a vehicle that was used more than 50% in a qualified business use. So um, business use does not include uh, investment use, leasing the property to a 5% owner or a related person. Uh, use of the property is compensation for services uh, performed by a 5% owner or related person. Or the use of the property is compensation uh, for any uh, person unless there's an amount that's included in that person's income for tax purposes and taxes were withdrawn if required. So we're just going to say we put in a service, a 2023 Toyota Corolla. And we put it into service on Since this is 2022 tax form, tax form we'll say that uh, we're filing late in 2023, but we place this vehicle in service on the first of the year. And for, for tax purposes, this was a vehicle that was solely dedicated to business. We did not use it in a personal capacity at all. So we would uh, enter the total cost. I don't know the cost of a new Toyota Corolla, but I'll put in $30,000. And we'll say that that is the same uh, basis for depreciation. So um, you would subtract any, any cost that you allocated to Section 179. So, for example, if we decided to put $10,000 over in the Section 179 section, then we would depreciate the other $20,000, right? So that's... That's how that works. So uh, for the recovery period, uh, generally uh, we're going to use um, 
we're going to depreciate this property because it was because it was placed into service after 1986. If it's used more than 50% for qualified business use, we can use a table that's in the form instructions for line 19, column D. If it was less than 50% uh, use in a business use, uh, then you would have to use the straight line uh, method or convention for, uh, for depreciation. So the recovery period, however, is five years for vehicles. So um, now there are approximately the four, four tables in the form instructions that specifically discuss uh, limits for passenger vehicles and uh, you know how much you can uh, depreciate and, and, and expense under section 179. So for the purpose of this one, uh, we have had this vehicle in service for uh, one year and it was placed into service in 2022. So we are able to um, put 11,200 as, as, as the maximum depreciation amount. Obviously, uh, we would have to change this number, but uh, we're using Let's see, we are using uh, the straight line convention method for this for simplicity's sake. We would be able to deduct up to 11,200 or expense it, but if we're using straight line, we're going to um, basically keep it at $6,000. We'll just make that a little bit. We don't need to use uh, I take that back. Since our normal deduction would be six thousand dollars, we're using the uh, the sorry half year convention. Uh, we're able to deduct three thousand dollars in the given tax year, uh, and then the rest of it will carry forward to the to the next tax year. So you can play around uh, based on the tables that are in the form instructions. Uh, based on what you're allowed to take as a special depreciation and allowance. You could certainly expense a lot more than this. You could expense, like I said, up to that $11,200 for this vehicle right here. Uh, if the property is used more than 50%, you, you, you do not have to use the straight line method. You can use the 200 or the 150 dB. Uh, you don't have to use, um, you do have to use a convention, but you you don't have to use the mid-quarter convention unless you've placed uh, over 40% of your depreciable assets into service in the last quarter of the year. So, since we only have one vehicle, we're going to calculate uh, line 28 based on the whopping total of $3,000. If we had any elected Section 179 costs here, we would enter them here since we don't. We're going to enter zero. We're going to go back up to line seven, and we're going to make sure that we've entered zero here. Okay, so that completes section A, which is the depreciation calculations for the listed property. In section B, this is uh, basically asking whether or not your your vehicle qualifies. Uh, for more or less than 50% use. And then um, Section C is for employers who provide vehicles uh, for employees to use. So we'll just uh, do this for a column A for our single Toyota Corolla that we put into use. And we'll say that we drove 20,000 miles. Uh, that was for business, to, right? So um, if we're not including commuting miles in this, but uh, so let's just say we spend another 5,000 miles on commuting, uh, 
uh, we did not use it for personal use, but if we did, we, we would include that here. So for giggles, we'll just assume that we used it partially for personal use and then see how that plays out. So the total number of miles driven in the year is the total of those three numbers, which in this case is $40,000 or 40,000 miles, of which uh, 20,000 was business uh, use. So technically, we'd have to move all that information down here. Let's just say that we ended up uh, driving only 10,000 miles for personal use. Now our 20,000 miles is more than 50% of this right here. The rest of these are yes, no questions. So was the vehicle available for personal use during off-duty hours? Well, these are pretty straightforward questions. No, I chose not to. I, I specifically uh, did not make it available for personal use. And if that was the case, and I was able to document that I never drove personal miles, um, was, was this primarily used by more than a 5% owner or related person? Well, probably yes. Is there another vehicle available for your personal use? Uh, if you say yes, then that kind of gives the signal that you really only use this for, for business, right? So uh, in section B, uh, if you're an employer, you don't have to complete this if you go through section C and um, you've answered yes to uh, one or more of these. Uh, you don't have to answer any of these questions for section B unless the person happens to be a related party or more than 5% owner. So let's go to section C and address it as if we were employers providing vehicles for employee use. So the IRS uh, has certain guidelines that they want you to have a policy statement to say. Those guidelines are right in the form instructions but it talks about whether or not you own and lease the vehicle for one or more employees to use. Is it kept on the premises when not in use? Uh, does anyone you know, who uses the vehicle live on site at your property? Uh, no, like this is what your um, policy statement should say. No one can use it for personal purposes with a de minimis exception of maybe stopping for lunch in between two work trips. So if you go make an office call at 10 o'clock and then you've got another appointment at 1, but you stop for lunch for somewhere, that's perfectly acceptable. Taking your wife out for dinner on a Friday night, not acceptable. So, and then if the employer reasonably believes that no employee uses uh, the vehicle for, for any purpose. So line 37 says... You have a policy that prohibits all personal use to include commuting. Most employers would probably allow their employees to commute back to back and forth to work using a vehicle. Line 38 says, do you have a policy that says you can commute, but everything else is not allowed for personal use? So um, this is not available uh, if you're a company corporate officer or director or 1% owner. So a 1% owner or a corporate you know, uh, officer or a director can, can abide by this policy and you can uh, treat this as a qualified vehicle uh, you know, as long as they're not using that vehicle for commuting. So uh, let's go through the rest of the policy questions really quickly. Do you treat all use of employees by vehicles or of vehicles by employees as personal use? No. Do you provide uh, more than five vehicles to your employees and then obtain information and retain the information? If the answer to this is yes, um, then uh, you, you don't need to use Section B for the covered vehicles. In fact, you don't need to use Section B if any of these answers happens to be yes. So, do you meet the requirements concerning qualified automobile demonstration use? Uh, 
So according to the form instructions, that would be, you know, if you had a car dealership, uh, but other than uh, full-time auto salespersons, uh, use would be prohibited. Uh, you can't use it on vacations. You can't store personal items in the vehicle. And uh, there's a limit on the total mileages outside of a salesperson's normal working hours. And then finally, you know, so if you uh, complete Part C, this is for employers that provide vehicles for employee use. So if you answer yes to any of these questions, you don't have to complete Section B. If you don't have employees, uh, you don't have to complete Section C. Now in Part 6, we're going to talk about amortization. So uh, amortization is uh, similar to uh, depreciation, except it mostly applies to costs that were incurred in uh, creating something of value, value or obtaining something of value that's not necessarily uh, easy to define. So there's a long list of costs that must be amortized over, uh, over an expected life. For example, bond premiums, geological and geophysical expenditures, R&D costs, uh, a lot of other things. Probably the most practical for most small business owners would be two items. Section 197 intangibles, uh, such as goodwill, business books and, and uh, records, licenses, uh, franchises, trademarks. Those are all things that you would amortize if you bought into a business and then you had to amortize the costs over a certain period of time. And then the other thing would be startup and organizational costs. So uh, you can amortize uh, business startup costs, organizational costs for a corporation or a partnership. So those are, so we'll just say we're amortizing startup costs. And we'll say that the startup costs begin January 1st of 2022. Now in column C, we're going to enter the total amount that you're amortizing. Uh, there are limits of, uh, that apply to each you know, category of amortizable costs. We'll say that uh, $10,000. And then under revenue code section, you have to put the revenue code section. Um, so business startup costs happen to be $195. Um, if you were looking at buying a business, that would be the $197 costs. But, um, and then amortization period or percentage. So uh, for For this, we're going to amortize this. Let's see, each one has a different um, amortization uh, period. So you can deduct a limited amount for the year that your business begins. So if you wanted to uh, amortize, you know, a certain amount, you can do that. Um, you don't have to attach a statement to make this election. Uh, once that election is made, it's irrevocable. Uh, anything else that's not deducted over that period of time must be uh, amortized over a 15-year period. So we're going to say 15 years, and uh, because of that, I'm going to change this to $15,000. Uh, so we'll amortize $1,000 a year for the next 15 years. So now if you had any costs that began uh, before the tax year, you would include them in line 20, uh, 43. Uh, you would have to uh, provide a calculation of all the costs um, that began. Um, if you, under certain circumstances, so if you're amortizing costs other than R&D expenditures that began and you otherwise don't need to complete this form, uh, then you simply can go to your tax return and enter the amortization number directly under the other deductions 
or the other expenses line. Uh, otherwise, you should plan to attach a statement that shows a description of the costs, the date that the amortization began, how much you're amortizing, the code section, the period, uh, the accumulated amortization, and then the amount for this year. So we'll say that that is zero. So the total happens to be exactly what what we totaled for items 42 and 43. So that would be a thousand dollars and then you would need to uh, determine where to put that on your income tax return. There are instructions for uh, sole proprietors on Schedule C uh, for uh, partnerships and S corporations. There are more specific guidance. So um, like I said, that's all we have for this tax form. And there's a lot that we covered in this video. There's a lot more detail that I expect people will ask about. So please feel free to hit me with your questions. I'm looking forward to drilling down to see which particular items uh, we needed to discuss a little bit more. Uh, so we've written an extensive, um, uh, comprehensive article on how to calculate depreciation and amortization expenses on your tax return. You can find that on our website. It's simply go to teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS Form 4562 into the search uh, function, and you should see our article. If you like our articles, please subscribe to our newsletter. And if you like our YouTube videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, post them in the comments section or send me an email. Thank you very much and have a great day.